Hello, I hope you had time to answer that Bellwer question. Um, maybe you looked it up, but we'll find out later, okay? For sure. So, you're supposed to know about typical adult crustacean, all right? Including the carapace, the segmented abdomen, um, jointed legs, bell work, um, and two pairs of antennae. That's probably a good clue as to what your scientific illustration is going to look like for this part of the unit, okay? So, um, joint-footed is what arthropods means, so there we go, we got it. Barnacle, shrimps, lobsters, crabs, insects. We're going to talk about all those except insects, because those are terrestrial, not marine. And they're the largest phylum of animals in the world with over a million known species, and we're discovering more and more all the time. These are some Florida, Florida or Caribbean uh, spiny lobsters, and they migrate in long marching lines like that every year. It's pretty wild. They have a chitinous skeleton. We have discussed this before. Tough and non-living. Remember chitin from your biology days. Um, chitin is similar to sugar, but the nitrogen in chitin makes it indigestible. So you can see the difference between chitin and glucose. You still have that hexagonal uh, macromolecule, right? That um, subunit, that monomer that makes up the chain. And in chitin's case, it's a, it's a sheet. Very similar to cellulose, but like in trees, um, which is also made from glucose, right? But that nitrogen makes it indigestible. So, and they have to molt. So here's a molting lobster. Here are molts from horseshoe crabs that you can find on the beach. Um, here is a picture by picture step of a molting crab. And then when the final, you can see the size, they'll come out similarly the same size, but then because their shell is now soft, you, it's soft like, like our tissue, you can push on it like this. You may have eaten soft shell crab if you've ever gone out to a seafood restaurant and you can fry them up and serve them on sandwiches because the chitin hasn't hardened yet. As long as it's kept out of water, the chitin won't reharden. It'll stay soft. Now, of course, that'll kill the crab, but if you keep it fresh, freshly caught, then eating it is perfectly acceptable. Um, but you can see that it swells up and then hardens to the new size. That's how they grow. And here's a spider crab actually shedding out of its shell. Insects do the same thing. So you might find some shells washed up on the shore at the beach and you think it's a dead crab, but it's just the, the um, shedded exoskeleton. And now he'd be, or she would be soft until about three days and then it would uh, harden. So crustaceans are the first subphylum. Phylum arthropoda, crustaceans are a subphylum of that. These are your shrimp, crabs, lobsters, and copepods. They have gills, so they have to always remain wet. Even land crabs have to go down into the water once in a while to keep their gills wet. Their exoskeleton is chitinous, but the chitin is um, hardened even, even harder with a calcium carbonate, which makes them really hard. That's why if you've ever eaten lobster or crab and you know you have to get one of those nutcracker things to crack them open sometimes. They have two pairs of antennae used for sensing their surroundings. Here is a, uh, a main lobster, and you can see those shorter antennae wiggling around just like an insect. These are bugs of the ocean. When you're eating a lobster or a crab, you're eating a, an ocean bug, just bigger, and the longer antennae here. And there are about 35,000 species of these different crustacea. Small ones are copepods. We've discussed these before, if you remember, the parasitic ones. They are planktonic. See how small this guy is? And they actually swim with their antennae. They don't have, you know, legs or anything like that. So they, they use the, the best appendage to swim with is from their head. And they swim like that. Um, here again, a reminder of your parasitic copepods. And they'll even parasitize a sea slug, which we learned about in our last set of notes, the nudibranchs. They're right here. 
little tiny copepods attached. Barnacles are, you wouldn't think that barnacles were related to lobsters and crabs and things, but they are, but they're sessile. They don't move around. They're stuck, they cement themselves to a hard object, okay? Um, they have feathery legs that sweep the water, okay? So they just keep going like that and keep capturing prey. Um, and their bodies are enclosed by heavy plates and there's all different kinds and they come in all different sizes. Uh, the most common types are the acorn barnacles like you see here that grow all over Florida. And believe it or not, this is a penis, that long substructure right there. Because they're sessile, all right, um, meaning not moving, they, how, how do they, and they don't um, broadcast their sperm and eggs like corals do or sponges and just um, do it that way. They, they have to have a, a mechanism to get the sperm to the other mate, all right? They actually have the longest penis in the world compared to body size. Compared to body size, okay? So they're, they're small. And this is the anatomy of one. So um, they're, here's their feeding siri or legs. These are their legs actually, and they just wave them to catch uh, food. Movable plates to seal up so when the tide goes, if something's gonna attack them, they can seal up or if the tide goes down and then they're going to be exposed to the air, they can take these plates and they can close them like a, like a door, capturing enough water inside to live until the tide comes up again. Beach hoppers are called amphipods. Um, a lot of people think that they're sand fleas, but they're not fleas at all. They're, they're kind of like um, the roly polies of, of the uh, marine world. Okay, you know, the uh, potato bugs, the terrestrial isopods, we're gonna talk about those on the next slide, I think. The very strong jumpers, some of them are parasitic, but um, they're not the fleas that we're, we consider fleas, like cats and dog fleas, different kind of animal, okay? Here's the isopods I was talking about. These are the marine ones. Um, fish lice are parasites. The sea louse or sea roach is neither a louse nor a roach. So it's not a lice or, or, or a roach. Lice is plural for louse. Um, they eat decaying seaweeds. So if you're up on the, if you're on the shore and all that brown sargassum weed that washed up on the beach, you can look at it carefully and you'll see these guys running around in there. And you can see some of them are actual uh, parasites, parasitic. And uh, they can get big. <laughs> they have deep sea ones that get this big and they've been around for millions of years. Since before the dinosaurs. Krill. Krill are a shrimp-like organism. They are planktonic, so they can't swim against the tide. Only up to six centimeters in length, so that's uh, two inches, okay, maximum. They have filter feeders with these legs in the front of their body. They wave them around to capture food. Um, and they're very important for the base of the food chain in uh, Antarctic waters, in colder waters, okay? And this is what they look like. So you can see how small they are. And they travel in, uh, in um, big balls like this, and these fish are feeding on, the, on them. And then a whale will come in, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, I'll show you here. A blue whale will eat those krill. So this is the largest animal in the world eating some of the smallest animals in the world. They just open up their mouth and that white material right there that's reflecting a lot of light, I know it's not a very good animation, but it was the best one I could find um, in such short notice. That's called baleen. We'll talk about that when we talk about whales, but baleen is a um, very coarse hair-like material. They don't have teeth, these kind of whales, and they filter out the, the krill from the water. So when they close their mouth, they push the water. It's like, a, it's like a, the teeth of a comb. And the, the krill get trapped, but the water passes through. 
All right, going back to the economic and ec ecological importance of krill, because that's in your textbook, and this is uh, obviously one of the standards that we have to know about for this class. So crustaceans feed on all sorts of other organisms, okay? And many animals also feed on crustaceans, including Antarctic krill. And we harvest many cr crustaceans, obviously lobsters, crab, shrimp, um, and we use krill to make feed for farmed fish and supplements. So we feed, we are taking food away from other animals. I mean, we always do that, right? Whenever we get fish out of the, out of the ocean, we're, we're affecting the food web. So we have to be really careful about how we um, are stewards of that natural resource. So again, the krill, you can see in this um, Antarctic food web are huge, I don't mean their size, I mean, if you look at virtually everything is tied into the krill. So if the krill population is decimated by overfishing, for example, it's going to have effects that are widespread throughout the entire food web. And, and, and alter the ecosystem in, in ways sometimes we don't even think of. All right, so moving on to something called decapods. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Deca, 10, pod, foot. So they have 10 feet or 10 legs. Okay, these organisms, shrimps, lobsters, and crabs specifically. There's over 10,000 species. They have five pairs of walking legs. Five times two is 10. Decapod. And the first pair usually has chelipeds, or these things, pinchers, chomp chomp. I don't know if you've been around long enough at the beach or fishing, or but if, um, if, you've been, if you're around long enough, you're gonna get bit by one, if you're gonna get pinched by one of these crabs eventually. And this is me back on that Noah vessel that we discussed a couple days ago in the other notes, um, holding, um, we caught a huge lobster. I mean, this thing, was the biggest lobster I've ever seen. But because of the nature of the dragging net, how we caught it in our fishery survey of the sea scallops, the lobster got in the wrong place at the wrong time and he got kind of broken up. He got kind of tore up in the, uh, in the netting process. And so this was pretty much all that was left of him, which was this, the, they, they have two different, lobsters and crabs have two different kinds of claws. They have a a tearing claw or ripping claw and they have a crushing claw okay and so you can see the difference between them this one it looks like a boxing glove and this one looks like a pair of scissors right and so if you look carefully at these organisms you can tell which one's which and the muscle in here is huge and yes yes we did eat that the chef on board um the cook we'll call him chef he uh, made or she at that point it wasn't he and then he got switched to a female or something like that long story um he uh made a salad out of that a, a lobster claw salad and it was really good so here is a um picture that you're going to be drawing most likely for this unit for your scientific illustrations okay and it's uh, not too bad. This is the external anatomy. Obviously, there's an internal anatomy too, but um, we're gonna focus on external because you don't have to know the internal. Shrimps, typically scavengers. Sometimes they're cleaner shrimp though, so they will uh, clean the parasites and dead skin off of fish and uh, other organisms that will come to the cleaning station where these shrimp live. Some of them are uh, can live within the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone, as we see here. Some of them burrow into the substrate. Some of them are pretty amazing. So, um, the mantis shrimp, you may know about the mantis shrimp, it moves its claws so fast to strike at prey that um, it makes a little explosion. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. These creatures never cease to amaze uh, us. Okay, so lobsters, mostly nocturnal, so they'll hide during the daytime, come out at night, they hide in rocks and little caves, coral crevices. 
course they have to catch prey and they're scavengers as well, so they'll do both. They do swim backwards because they have this telson, this fan-like tail. Um, was, it, was it the right word? Telson, yeah, I got it right, okay? And uropods, so this is the telson, these are the uropods, and they swim backwards. So you'll see it, the tail, the, the, when they swim away, the head will be looking at you as they swim away, because the tail's pushing, bringing them backwards, okay? And this is the head of a Maine lobster, <clears throat> the kind of lobsters most people think about other than spiny lobsters, and there's a spiny lobster. So spiny lobsters don't have those big chelipeds, the ripping one or the tearing one and the crushing one. Um, they have much smaller ones, and much, uh, they still have 10 legs, so decapods, and these really long antennae, muscular antenna, and people eat those as well. Particularly the tails, just the tails in those. <clears throat> Hermit crabs. Found this one while on, that, on the Albatross IV, the Noah vessel. It was living inside of a sponge as a form of symbiosis. It was using the sponge um, as a shell. And this is what they look like without their shell. That's why they're not true crabs. They're called anomora crabs. Anomora means differently tailed. And so they're not true crabs like the crabs I'm about to teach you about. Um, and so they use the shells of other organisms. They don't make their own shells. So snails typically um, to, to live in. That's just quite amazing that relationship, ecological relationship between those two organisms. Mole crabs are also anamorph crabs that have differently tailed. They're a small genus of decapod. Uh, and they're also called sand, they're called sand crabs, which is common names are always so bad to scientists because um, fishermen will call 10 different things a sand crab. So we never know what they're talking about. So they have to describe it. They may know what they're talking about, but if they, let's say use the genus and species, then you're not being specific enough. People also call them sand fleas. You may go to the bait shop and say, I need, uh, you know, I, I would like a, a bucket of sand fleas to go fishing on, on, at the beach. And um, you just hook these guys onto a hook and you throw them out there and the fish love them. They're great bait, but they're not sand fleas. They're not fleas, they're crabs. So they're called mole crabs. If you want to be more specific with how you t talk about these in the future, um, if you're a fisherman, then, or at the beach and somebody, some kids are finding them, remember the name mole crab because they dig in the sand like that. They dig right down in the sand really, really fast. And they use their um, antennae for feeding. They sweep the water when they're in the sand and they live in here. They live in the swash zone right there. Right where the waves are washing up on shore and the waves go out and the little bubbles, little holes you can dig really fast and you'll, you'll catch them. And they don't hurt. You can hold them in your hand like that. They'll wriggle around. So here's the true crabs. They have a cephalothorax. Cephala, head, thorax, chest. So their head is like, and their chest are like one thing, okay? So imagine Mr. Krabs, this is an actual crab, okay? Imagine you just, removing your neck and putting your head on top of your shoulders. You'd have a cephalothorax, okay? They're adapted, evolved for high mobility. They swim really well, swim and crawl around very well. Um, the largest and most diverse group is over 45, approximately 4,500 species, and many of them have specialized diets, okay? So here's a blue claw crab, Here's a fiddler crab, and they pretty much just use that claw for attracting mates. That's what they do with that. Males have a V-shaped bottom, and females have a U-shaped bottom. Okay? Um, these are babies. So when the crab eggs hatch, they become zoe larva. And they look so cute. Okay? And you can see the parts are there. They're just oddly oriented. I, um, this is probably to stop them from being ingested by too many things as they're developing. And then the megalops stage, so they, 
they um, metamorphosize, just like butterflies, you know, from stage to stage, like this. Many organisms do this. Fish do this, they have a larval stage, and then they grow up, and they look very different from their um, larval stage, okay? From the adult stage. And you see this is looking more like an adult decapod than that stage, okay? And these are planktonic, right? So the biology of crustaceans, we are a little more than halfway through our notes here. Um, slide 26, if you somehow got lost. So the appendages closest to the mouth are called maxillopeds, and they're used to sort out food and push it towards the mouth. Decapods have three pairs of these ma maxillopeds. And I have never been bitten by a crab. Pinched with the claws, yes, but a crab, I don't think it has the ability to actually do any damage with its mouth parts, its, max, its maxillopet. Now, this is just gross. This is real, though, okay? This is a red crab, and certain parts of the world, um, they have an ex population explosion. And the, this is a, a gravid female. Gravid means it's, she's with eggs, and it can refer to anything, turtles, sharks, Anything that carries eggs, if it has its eggs, it's called gravid. And this gravid female, you see all her eggs here, getting ready to hatch and turn into babies. And I think you figured out what's happening here now. These aren't her babies, but they're her species. Okay, so this is cannibalism. She's just plenty of food, picking up babies and eating them. Pretty wild. The red crab, it's called the red crab. So food, the babies in that case, pass down to the stomach where there are these chitinous teeth. They have a gastric mill, kind of like a bird has a crop in its gut or gizzard, you know, and that grinds up seeds and things like that. Well, this is very similar, except it's made out of chitin, and, uh, and it, uh, it's almost like a tooth in its stomach, a tooth in a t or t a rows of teeth in its stomach that it um, helps to digest its food, called chitinous teeth. And they have compound eyes that could be a bundle of up to 14,000 light-sensitive units grouped into a mosaic, kind of like an insect's eye almost. And this is a mantis shrimp, looking around. Here is a crab, a sand, or a ghost crab. We have those here in Florida. If you've ever been to the beach, you might see their holes on the beach. Uh, especially in the morning, holes about that big, and outside of the hole are a bunch of little crawl marks, you know, footprints of the crab. And this is, he's just cleaning his eyes, just giving him a good windshield wiper right there, okay? And that's what they look like up close, a mosaic, like a tile mosaic. Other marine arthropods are the horseshoe crab, um, four species of the genus Limulus, this is Limulus polyphemus, uh, the one that grows here in Florida. And they're all the class Meristomata. They're not true crabs. Um, and they live on soft bottoms like sand or mud, and they like to eat worms and other soft uh, creatures like that. They're very neat creatures. I grew up with these guys. This is what they look like upside down. If you were to flip one over, these are the gills, okay? There's the mouth right in there. These are feet that have little walking, like, legs on the end, claws, you could put your hand right in there and it, would, it can't hurt you. They're, very, they're quite harmless. The only way that this creature can hurt you is if you were walking and you stepped on its tail. It's not venomous, it's not poisonous, um, but it would, it would poke you. Um, I've never been poked by one. We typically carried them by that when we were kids. We'd walk around and carry them like that. But the, probably the best way to carry them is holding them by their... By their um, their body, their carapace, okay? Carapace. And they have a couple different sets of eyes. They walk that direction with the tail, obviously, telson behind them. And these are light sensing, light receptor eyes and compound eyes on there. And they look, they look kind of scary, but you know, we're afraid of things we don't know, right? But you should never be afraid of these guys. They're very harmless. They're, they're like little, cute little animals. They're, they, they, don't, they don't hurt anybody at all. 
Um, horseshoe crabs, during mating season, they will pile up on the beaches like this. And uh, we found these, in, this, I did not take this picture, but I've seen a picture like this many times in New York, but even in Florida. Uh, this was on the west coast though, near Tampa, uh, in between Tampa and uh, St. Petersburg. We, they were all washed up like this and they were all mating. The, ma the males and the females will, will couple up just like this. The female is underneath, the male on top. And he will fertilize her eggs, external fertilization. And, uh, they, and then uh, during the next high tide, um, next full moon, the babies, tinier than this even, will crawl. That one's probably about, you see the size of the sand grains there. This one's probably about that big, maybe. So, and they'll crawl away. They've been around since the dinosaur times. They're quite amazing. Sea spiders are even odder looking. Look at this. This is a deep sea sea spider. They're not spiders. Not spiders. They feed on soft invertebrates. They're common in cold water, so we're probably not going to have too, too many of them here in Florida. But I still figure you should know about them because they are arthropoda. They come in all different sizes. It's amazing creatures. It's like otherworldly, right? Invertebrate chordates. Okay, now we are moving on from all of these invertebrate creatures that we're talking about, and we're gonna, I'm gonna give you this, this middle section that kind of connects the invertebrates with the vertebrates, and then our very next slide presentation is going to be about bony fish. Fish, woo, finally, okay? No backbone, these, these invertebrate chordates, they do have a spinal cord though. So if these are all vertebrates right here, okay? Mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians and fish, okay? And these interesting creatures we'll talk about next time, and, cartilaginous fish like sharks and rays, we're talking about this group here. Okay? All of these are in phylum chordata. They have a spinal cord or something similar. But only these are the ones we're going to talk about and to finish up this set of slides today. Okay? So to be a chordate, an organism needs three outstanding characteristics. And the first one is called a dorsal hollow nerve cord and that runs along the dorsal length of the animal. So humans, that turns into the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, this is a picture of your dorsal hollow nerve cord. There's a spinal cord, nerve roots, and peripheral nerves that go down. This is a lancelet, which we're gonna talk about in this set of notes, and they have this dorsal hollow nerve cord. No bones, no bones about it, okay? It forms, um, when uh, during um, cell replication in a zygote, sex cells, male and female, sperm and egg come together to make the zygote, and then the cells start replicating, and they start folding like this based upon the genetic code that's in the DNA, and it makes a um, neural tube for this nerve tissue to go through. And that's what separates these organisms from the rest of the, uh, in, from other lower organisms, okay, like the ones we've all been learning about. The second one is our pharyngeal gill slits, either in the adult stage or in embryonic stage, okay? So in an embryo, for example, in, um, in mammals, birds, reptiles, we all have, in, as embryonic creatures, pharyngeal gill slits that go away and turn into our trachea um, and other parts of our, of our throat. And so a lancelet, which I'm going to teach you about those in a moment, have those as well. Small openings along the anterior part of the gut. And then finally, the notochord. The notochord is a flexible rod for su uh, support that lies between the nerve cord and the gut. It's not bones, okay? But in, in, in uh, most chordates, mammals, reptiles, fish, birds, Okay, it turns into, it gets replaced by a series of articulating bones, articulating, moving, okay, bones called a backbone, but not in the creatures we're going to discuss today, okay? So the protochordates, no backbone. They're very simple creatures, actually, but it's just amazing how they have this connection between the invertebrates and like creatures like us, okay? So the tunicates. Tunicates are called that because they have this tunic, almost like a, like a tunic is like a, a shirt like this, almost, okay? Uh, 
made out of a leathery or gelatinous type of material, outer covering. And they're, all, they're, they're also, uh, a certain kind of them, they're called sea squirts. Okay? So you may have seen these growing somewhere on a dock or on a piling or on a rock somewhere. If you step on them or if you squeeze them, they, they squirt. Like water shoots out of, the, of these holes called osculum. And there are about 1,300 species. The first kind are the sea squirts, okay? They have sac-like bodies. They're fouling organisms. We've discussed that word in the past, fouling organism. What does it mean to foul something? Nothing to do with birds or baseball. Can be anchored in soft sediments, but they're usually on, on um, harder things. They're the only sessile chordates. So the only chordates that are stuck in one spot, that don't move. They're filter feeders, so they bring water in through one opening and bring it out the, out the other. Similar to other creatures we've seen, like maybe even sponges. So they have an in-current and X-current siphon. And they only have a notochord and dorsal nerve cord. When larval, when they be, reach adults, they lose that, which is very strange. It's kind of like when we have pharyngeal gill slits, when we're larval, embryonic, um, but then they go away later on. Metamorphosis, we talked about that word earlier with the crabs. And some of them quite stunning, living with the coral here, and very colorful, looks, looks, like a, looks like some kind of glass vase that somebody would buy at a, at a gift shop, okay? So here's a sea squirt uh, adult and larval form before it settles down. And you can see its notochord here and dorsal hollow nerve cord running all the way down for support. But then they're gone as an adult, metamorphosize and they disappear. Something called a salp, they're virtually see-through, but they do have um, a dorsal hollow nerve cord and they form chains or colonies that could be up to several meters long. They're planktonic all the time. They have uh, bands of muscle through their body that enable them to move, okay, but not go against current. So here are the, this is, uh, I think they dyed this. So here are the bands of muscle that run through their body. Okay, this is like a intestinal tract right there. Lancelets, here we go. These are the critters we were talking about before. There are about 25 species. Honestly, I can't remember ever seeing one. I grew up on the water. Still go to the beach all the time. I was there Sunday morning, uh, this past Sunday, and you know, I, I wasn't looking for these creatures, but apparently they exist. I don't know, ex they, you know they're in the sand. Or I don't know how deep they go, or if they're up right at the beach, probably not, because they're kind of soft, they're not shelled. Um, I've never seen one, ever. I've never, ever seen one of these before in my life. And they're fish-shaped. Hmm. There's a question about that in your notes, okay? And this is pretty much the answer, all right? Only the lack of backbone separates this form of vertebrates and bony fish. And they use their gill slits to filter food from outside. So they have a mouth, they have gill slits, they pull water in here, the gill slits uh, filter out the food particles and the water leaves. And they also breathe that way, obviously. And they stick out of the sand like this. So here's their mouth with little whiskers almost, okay? And here's another look at them. And this is our last slide, I believe. So they sit in the sand, they have tentacles, and they just filter feed that way. And here's an actual picture of one, so. All right.